the city officially denies flood damage liability. A final report on a major north side gas leak investigation. And a Canadian author wins the Nobel Prize for Literature. Good evening and thank you for joining us. It's news that 1,900 property owners in Thunder Bay may not be welcoming. The city has issued a news release today saying that they're not liable for property damage during the May 28, 2012 rainstorm. The update follows a lengthy investigation that was recently completed. As Courtney Rutherford reports, the results show that the unprecedented rainstorm was the cause of the unfortunate losses. Flood affected homeowners across Thunder Bay will be receiving a letter from the city if they haven't already. It comes following a lengthy investigation that found the city is not liable or responsible for any property lost. The letter states that the city has never received as much rain in such a short time frame, that there was simply too much water for the system to handle, even with the excess capacity at the water pollution control plant. City manager Tim Camisso says that although they are acknowledging there were losses, from their standpoint, along with their insurance adjuster, they believe they've done all they can to help those affected. The reality of it is, is you know, we're, we're going through a process. Uh, we've helped as many people as we can. We understand there are a lot of people affected negatively. You know, we put in place measures. We're moving forward. We've had safe homes. We had, you know, the DRC, which is wrapping up now. So we've done everything we think we could to help people. The reality of it is, this is, this is getting into you know, more in the legal realm and I'm not going to, I'm not going to respond. However, the results of the investigation aren't going to stop a $300 million class action lawsuit from moving forward. That's according to lawyer Sandy Zaitsev, who's working on the case. He says there are a number of mistruths in the release sent out by the city and he's taking issue with much of what has been claimed. For instance, this is not the largest rainstorm that the city has ever had and the plant has survived bigger rainstorms than this many times. <clears throat> we have four plant operators as experts, two former operators of this plant who say that the city should have easily ran the plant through that storm with maybe 40, maybe 100 houses with sewage in them. Zaitsev believes that the city is trying to confuse and intimidate people involved with the lawsuit. He hopes to go to trial as early as December of this year. Courtney Rutherford, TBT News. Penalties have now been handed down in relation to a gas leak earlier this year that shut down 10 city blocks in Thunder Bay. In June, hundreds of people were evacuated on the city's north side after a natural gas line was clipped on Red River Road. The Technical Standards and Safety Authority launched the investigation into that lake. The TSSA says the reason the gas line was struck was due to improper locates and a lack of oversight on the part of the technician. Orders have now been issued to London, Ontario-based GTEL Engineering and their technician. The company will pay the $10,000 cost of the investigation and has been told to hire a full-time quality assurance person in Thunder Bay. Union Gas has also been ordered to institute a quality assurance program. District Manager David Sword says that was something the company was already in the process of doing. He calls the incident a learning opportunity. No orders have been issued against the city. Senior staff initially blamed poor mapping of the underground infrastructure. The TSSA has decided against prosecution, which could have led to large fines or even imprisonment. Meanwhile, the Ministry of Labour continues its investigation into the incident. The municipality of Shunya has decided to fight back over a recent court decision on O'Connor Point. A judge issued an injunction prohibiting Shunya from using or allowing the public to use the area. In the ruling, the judge said without an injunction, the plaintiffs will continue to suffer. Those plaintiffs, two families who live near the beachfront property, have each filed $1 million lawsuits. Any potential damages awarded will likely be the focus of a trial, but Shunya Council has decided to appeal the decision. They feel a security firm they hired this summer brought the situation under control, but the families insist drinking, trespassing and interference to people, pets and property continued. A committee trying to enhance First Nation representation on juries has some challenges ahead. The co-chair of the group says that's because many First Nations people simply don't trust the legal system in Ontario. The Implementation Committee held a meeting here in Thunder Bay today. 
The group was set up following recommendations from former Supreme Court Justice Frank Iacobucci, who found glaring problems and omissions from jury roles here in northwestern Ontario. Co-chair Alvin Fidler says the province must create conditions to make people comfortable enough to participate in Ontario's justice system. It's been very, very low. Uh, in fact, uh, some of the numbers that we're hearing uh, is, is quite disturbing. Uh, and, you know, the fact that uh, entire communities were left out or have been left out uh, from, the, uh, uh, from the justice system, from the jury role process, and that's something that uh, uh, we need to fix. The 11-person committee heard some personal stories today from those in attendance, including that from a woman who said she received a jury notice but then left it on her counter for months. Committee co-chair Erwin Glasberg wants to increase the low response rates. There needs to be uh, more done to um, help uh, increase awareness um, of, of individuals um, in, in these communities about uh, the importance of the jury process. The committee has a one-year mandate to oversee the implementation of those recommendations. Policing has changed not only in Thunder Bay, but across the province. That, according to North Bay Police Chief and President of the Ontario Association of Chiefs of Police, Paul Cook. Speaking today at a joint meeting between the OACP and the Ontario Association of Police Services Board, Cook said the majority of police resources are now being spent in areas other than traditional law enforcement and crime prevention. And he's calling on senior levels of government to help change that. Uh, about 80% of it has nothing to do with crime and crime stats. It's dealing with marginalized people, uh, people that have addictions and mental health issues. And uh, so that's the discussion that's taking place. And, you know, from a police leadership perspective, we've made it very clear if we're going to stop responding to some of these calls, uh, then government really has to step up and ensure they're properly funding and resourcing the organizations that are going to do that. Potential changes to the OPP costing model were also discussed. Right now, some communities pay more for their police services than others, according to Deputy Commissioner Vince Hawks. So if you have a busier community, then that community would pay more. And it's really not quite fair to just go and rely on that piece because uh, a community that uh, would be a hub of activity, uh, they would be actually paying more for the cost of policing than the outskirts, the outlying areas where everyone comes into the town and something happens and, and there's more calls for service. Hawks wants to standardize that process so communities pay equal amounts for basic service for the cost based on call volume to be calculated separately. The meeting continues tomorrow. A Thunder Bay businessman has been hit with a hefty fine for failing to file both personal and corporate income tax returns. According to the Canada Revenue Agency, Pasquale Stilla pled guilty to failing to file his personal returns in 2007-2008. He also pled guilty to 16 other counts of failing to file corporate returns between 2003 and 2008 for businesses he ran that include Central Spring, The Spring People, and G. Stilla and Sons Trucking. He's been fined $3,000 on each count for a total of $54,000. Stilla also faced an October 8th deadline to file, file rather, all outstanding returns. Ontario's environmental watchdog says the governing Liberals are deliberately dismantling protections in the province. Gord Miller says the government is gutting the Ministry of Natural Resources through budget cuts and regulatory changes. The Environment Commissioner says crucial safeguards for provincial parks, species at risk and crown lands have been weakened. He says Ontario spends less on natural resource management and environmental protection than five other provinces and warns this could have disastrous results. Here in northwestern Ontario, we're very fortunate to have a place like the Regional Cancer Centre. Patients no longer need to travel to uh, southern Ontario or elsewhere for treatment. Instead, they get to stay around family and friends and get treatment at a world-class institution. Now, the Regional Health Sciences Centre has launched a new plan to make that care even more exceptional. Matt Scooby has more on that story and how the public's being asked to help. Sean Christie knows firsthand what kind of care the Regional Cancer Care Program provides. Two years ago, doctors found three tumors in Christie's neck. He's gone through many chemotherapy and radiation treatments, but just four months ago, doctors discovered another tumor. Christie says he's thankful he's been able to stay in Thunder Bay to get the treatment he needs. Anybody who's been through cancer, if you had to leave here to go have it done somewhere else and not have the support of your family and the supportive care that you get within this centre, I, I really don't know if, how many people could do that. It's stories like Christie's that have led to the new Exceptional Cancer Care Plan. 
The biggest part of that plan is an investment of more than $30 million into new state-of-the-art equipment for the cancer center. Director of the Regional Cancer Program, Joanne LeCourcier, says the new plan was driven by patients and she outlined some of the new additions for the program. The majority of funds raised through this campaign are going to be contributed toward investment in um, equipment like linear accelerators for the delivery of radiation treatment. We're uh, supporting the, um, the uh, investment in the new uh, mobile screening coach that delivers uh, breast, colorectal and cervical screening opportunities to patients in hard to reach and underserved populations in northwestern Ontario. While most of the required funding will come from various levels of government, $5.9 million needs to be raised in the community. Exceptional Care Campaign Chair Paul Fitzpatrick says $3 million has already come in, mostly through local business donations. For this cabinet team of uh, community leaders to be able to go out and, uh, and raise $25,000, $50,000, $100,000 increments from, uh, from various businesses and individuals is a marvelous accomplishment. And we still have asks that are out there right now, so we're confident that we have more coming in from that particular phase of the campaign. We will gladly uh, to take anybody's contribution. The remaining $2.9 million needs to be raised in the next year. The Fort William Rotary Club has committed $500,000 over the next five years to the cause. Those wishing to contribute can log on to the Health Sciences Foundation's website or visit the hospital. Matt Scooby, TBT News. The Ontario government is making it a priority to come up with another plan to combat poverty. In 2008, the government released a poverty reduction strategy. That led to the development of the Ontario Child Benefit and helped lift 47,000 children out of poverty. But now the strategy needs to be updated. MPPs Michael Gravel and Bill Morrow met with representatives from a number of different sectors to discuss the issue today. Consultation meetings like this have been taking place across the province in order to get feedback on what's worked well and what needs improving. Gravel says it remains a significant issue and while there have been some positives, there's still more work to do. With the, uh, uh, the number of First Nations that we have in, uh, in northwestern Ontario, uh, with the number of people who are living below the poverty line, uh, with the unique geographical challenges that we have in, uh, in northwestern Ontario, there are, I think, some specific needs in northwestern Ontario, but we have a, a very important uh, a perspective on it, and that's why it was so important from my perspective to be sure that the, uh, uh, the cons consultation took place here in Gavell adds that a report will be compiled and brought to a cabinet committee before being presented to Premier Kathleen Wynne, but he couldn't put a timeline on when that will happen. The provincial government is scuttling plans to build two new nuclear reactors. The Liberals had planned to spend up to $10 billion to build the two new nuclear plants, but government sources are now confirming those plants will not be built after all, since the extra electricity will no longer be needed. Instead, the province says they will be refurbishing existing nuclear reactors. Well, every year around this time, families across the country begin to prepare for their annual Thanksgiving feast. But not everyone has the comfort of enjoying a home-cooked meal. Here in Thunder Bay, the Dew Drop Inn serves over 300 of the city's less fortunate. And thanks to a little help from students at St. Jude's School, one of the staple menu items has been taken care of. Courtney Rutherford reports. It makes me feel good because then, because if I was in that position and I needed someone like that to help me, then it'd be nice to know that somebody could do that for me too. Grade 6 student Aiden Frenette knows the message of giving quite clearly. He, along with 30 of his classmates, have all baked pumpkin pies to donate to Dew Drop In's annual Thanksgiving feast. It's not only an opportunity for these kids to give, but a chance to realize the struggles that many people living in the city deal with on a daily basis. Well, we were fortunate yesterday where we went to the uh, Dew Drop In website, and when we found out they served a million people in the last 25 years, it was quite eye opening. And I think this will really help them with the uh, skill of empathy and going forward in their lives where they can be very virtuous in that way. The meal continues to remain the same year after year. Turkey, mashed potatoes and stuffing are just a few of the items on the menu. It takes 12 turkeys to feed the expected 350 guests. But it's not only the food preparations that need volunteers. Each time they hold a dinner, they need between 30 to 35 people helping to make the meal go off without a hitch. We have people in the kitchen serving the plates. Then out here, we have to have somebody serving the coffee, the tea, the tomato juice. It's a sit-down meal, so we wait on them. And then once they're finished the main plate, then they have dessert, and people serve them that. 
Those looking to volunteer at Monday afternoon's dinner can call ahead or drop by Monday at any time. Those dedicating their time will be serving until the last person who walks through the door is fed. Courtney Rutherford, TBT News. Well, let's turn to weather, uh, turn to weather now, uh, Matt. <laughs> I'm thinking about pumpkin pie. Uh, anyway, <laughs> it's hard not to right now, I know. I know. It was a beautiful day out there uh, once again. Uh, another, absolutely right, another spectacular day outside. And yeah, now you're making me hungry. Yeah, pumpkin pie, even that piece, just uh, looking at it, it looks delicious. Can't wait for this weekend. But uh, today, uh, over today, we saw that increasing cloud into the region. Saw this about this morning, about uh, 7, 8 o'clock is when the clouds started moving in and stayed uh, in Thunder Bay and for most of the region, for most of the day, in fact. Uh, but the temperature is still great. We are actually about double where we are supposed to be right now, if that makes sense. 20 degrees, we're supposed to be seeing 10 degrees right now at this time of year. So an absolutely beautiful day uh, in Thunder Bay. Mostly cloudy skies, as I mentioned, a little bit of wind, uh, only up to 17 kilometers an hour uh, this afternoon is when it peaked. Uh, and it's still out there right now, just a little bit. Uh, across the region, it's pretty much the same story. Have a look at Fort Francis, 22 degrees, 20 degrees in Atacokan, some beautiful tempers and, and mainly the beautiful sunshine all over the place as well. That continues right along the North Shore into Greenstone, seven Sault Ste. Marie at 17 degrees as well. And again, seeing mainly sunny skies at this point. So some beautiful temperatures right across the region that's going to continue for tomorrow as well, for the most part. Anyways, uh, clearing tonight, clearing by midnight. It's going to remain a little bit cloudy until tonight. Uh, six degrees is our low this evening. We're not going to reach that probably till about 4 a.m. in the morning, however. So keep that in mind. It's going to be another pretty nice night out there. Uh, again, no wind uh, really to speak of at all. Tomorrow, we're going to right on the cusp of this line of showers. It's going to be windy. Some howling winds is coming in with this low pressure system into the region. Uh, that is not going to push in until Saturdays. You see the low that's going to move all the way up, but we are underneath the jet stream. So that's going to be some brisk air that's going to coming, be coming into the region for the next few days. And that shower and that low pressure system is going to bring about a bunch of showers for a Saturday, Sunday. So I wish the news was better for Thanksgiving weekend. But unfortunately, it looks like we're going to have rain. I'll have more details that coming up later in the news hour. So you're going to have to stay inside to enjoy that pumpkin pie. Right? Yes, probably. <laughs> Thanks very much, Matt. Well, a significant court ruling in British Columbia today, one that almost ensures the issue of assisted suicide will go before our Supreme Court. We'll have details on that story and more for you as your Thursday News Hour continues. will not gain power or choices at the end of life by giving power to the health care system to provide assisted suicide.
A BC appeals court in a split decision has upheld Canada's law against doctor-assisted suicide. And our lower court had earlier found that law was unconstitutional. The case was brought by ALS patient Gloria Taylor, who has since died. Duncan McHugh has details. It's been a controversial case from the start. Today, no different. I won't tread on your toes, and you as well should, should respect my wishes. At the centre, Gloria Taylor, a woman suffering from ALS who wanted permission for a doctor to end her life before she became incapacitated. I am absolutely not afraid to die. Hers, the same situation Sue Rodriguez was in 20 years ago when she took her plea to the highest court in the land and lost. The Rodriguez case was the major hurdle facing Taylor, but last year, victory when a BC trial judge declared Canada's law against physician-assisted suicide unconstitutional. Taylor died of a severe infection not long after. Oh, thank you, God. Thank you. Now, in a split decision, BC's Court of Appeal says the trial judge erred, affirming the Supreme Court of Canada's Rodriguez decision, finding the blanket prohibition on assisted suicide preferable to a law that might not adequately prevent abuse. Still, the court suggested if Rodriguez is reconsidered, perhaps a solution lies in constitutional exemptions for those who are clear-minded, supported in their life expectancy by medical opinion, rational and without outside influence, and protected by a court process. Anti-euthanasia groups applauded the decision. We will not gain power or choices at the end of life by giving power to the health care system to provide assisted suicide. Taylor's lawyers vow to appeal. The federal government has no, bet, no place at the bedside of seriously and incurably ill Canadians who have made firm decisions about the amount of care they wish to receive at the end of life. Mindful this case is likely bound for a higher court and Parliament is in no rush to reopen the debate. This decision suggests doctor and court approved legal exemptions may offer respite to the terminally ill who seek help to end their lives. But for now, the law against assisted suicide stands. Duncan McHugh, CBC News, Vancouver. Egyptian authorities say two Canadian activists are now free to leave the country. John Grayson and Tarek Lubani had been barred from flying out, even after they were released from a Cairo prison. Sasha Petrasek reports. After seven weeks in prison and five days in a kind of legal limbo, John Grayson and Tarek Lubani are finally free to leave Egypt. They were picked up August 16th in the middle of a violent demonstration here in the center of Cairo. They were detained along with some 600 other Muslim Brotherhood members as the police and the public prosecutor considered whether they should be charged with any kind of criminal act. Their release from prison last Sunday. They went to the airport almost immediately to try to board a flight for Canada, but they were turned back, told the investigation was still continuing. So they've waited in a hotel room with just a few words for their supporters released on YouTube yesterday. We're stuck a bit. The ordeal's not over. Their Egyptian lawyers and Canadian officials continued the fight, the appeals to the public prosecutor to have them freed. Today, that succeeded. It's not clear when they will actually leave Egypt. Not clear how long it'll take for the paperwork to be ready. But now, finally, they can come home to Canada. Sasha Petrasek, CBC News, Cairo. The Canada-wide manhunt for a sex offender has come to an end. Edmonton police have located Michael Stanley, a man with a long record of victimizing children. The 48-year-old was found in Washington State after cutting off his monitoring bracelet more than a week ago. Stanley had fled to Lethbridge, Alberta, and his bracelet was later found in the city of Lloydminster on the Saskatchewan border. He crossed from British Columbia into Washington State at the Blaine border crossing on the evening of October 7th. Law enforcement agencies are aware that uh, of Stanley's whereabouts. The Edmonton Police Service has notified the appropriate agencies in the United States and will be consulting with Crown prosecutors uh, for the possibility of, of uh, extradition for Stanley back to Canada. Alice Monroe has long been known as one of Canada's finest writers. Today, she was recognized as one of the best in the world. Monroe is this year's recipient of the Nobel Prize for Literature. Deanna Sumanak has the story. My mother's ideas were in line with some progressive notions of her time. 
Her stories talk about emotional events in the lives of ordinary people. But this morning, as Alice Munro found out she had won the Nobel Prize for Literature, she was the one overcome with emotion. It, it just seems impossible. It seems so, such a splendid thing to happen that uh, I can't describe it. It's, it's more than I can say. Monroe was called Master of the Contemporary Short Story by the Swedish Academy, the organization that gives out the prize. It's something Canadians in the literary circles have always known. <laughs> and now a toast to Alice Monroe, who has given us all too much happiness. For a long time, it was a struggle for Canadian writers to write about Canadian topics and to and to be small townish. Uh, uh, we we've been told for forever that that doesn't sell um, out in the wider market. And and Alice Monroe blazed that trail for all of us. Monroe's stories not only sold, they paved the way for generations of Canadian authors particularly women. Monroe is the first Canadian woman and one of only 13 in the award's 110-year history to win the Nobel Prize for Literature. Toronto writer Catherine Govier says Monroe's success in writing about lives of women and families was an inspiration. She stuck to what she knew and what, was, what she did well and just plumbed it to the depths. So that's, I think that's, that's really important. It's a, good, it's a good message for, for other writers out there. Earlier this year, 82-year-old Monroe said she would retire from writing. She says even a Nobel Prize will not dissuade her from that decision. Deanna Sumanak, CBC News, Toronto. People who subscribe to Rogers for their cell phone service are having an ordinary day today. What happened last night was anything but ordinary. For several hours, there were nationwide interruptions on their network. Everett Gould has the story. Whenever I make a phone call, it like hangs up immediately. The frustration was felt phone. across the country. Yeah, I missed a lot of calls, actually. And... This map shows where Rogers' wireless phones failed. Through the outage, the concern grew that people in trouble would be unable to use cell phones to call for help. Let's just hope that uh, the real emergencies, people will find a way to get a hold of us and we'll respond. After five hours, it was largely over, although the frustrations remain. I've been... Um, a disappointed customer for a while. I have a lot of bones to pick with them. Rogers is going to give its wireless customers a credit on their accounts. The CEO saying in a statement, I sincerely apologize to all of our customers for this significant inconvenience. Very simple technology. Graham Janaway is a consultant who advises businesses on how to keep their key systems operating. He says wireless phone networks in Canada are extremely reliable, outages rare but he still wouldn't give up his landline. This is convenience. This is continual connectivity until it goes down. This one is emergency, much more than anything else. There is one American who knew about Rogers' problems <laughs> almost instantly. Glenn Rogers on Twitter was flooded with thousands of complaints last sure, night. I was probably one of the, uh, the first in, uh, uh, maybe before Rogers were the first to, to realize that they had an outage when uh, my phone just started vibrating continuously and uh, I was receiving a lot of these app messages uh, venting frustration. Add him to the list of millions of people who hope the problem with Rogers' phones doesn't return. Havard Gould, CBC News, Toronto. Folks along the north shore of Lake Superior will sympathize with this. Thick fog has enveloped eastern China's Jiangsu province. The dense haze left many cities at a standstill. Expressways have been shut down, with some cities reporting less than 20 metres of visibility. On a major canal in the province, more than 500 ships had to be left stranded. Well, word of a possible, some possible movement on that U.S. budget impasse had a big impact on the major markets today. Toronto saw the TSX jump 164 points to 12,894. The Dow posted its biggest single-day gain of the year climbing to 323 points to 15,126. And the Nasdaq, meantime, was up 83 points to 37.60. The Canadian dollar slipped two one-hundreds to 96.19 cents U.S. Gold fell $2 to $1,296 an ounce. And oil held steady at $103 a barrel.
A Bay Area baseball fan should be out in force tonight. They're looking for a big game from the Oakland Athletics. Yeah, and hopefully uh, they can respond with the Detroit Tigers. Uh, they probably have the experience factor on their side. And Justin Verlander. Yeah, yeah you know, one of baseball's best pitchers, exactly. no doubt. Well, the last of the division series will come to a close in Oakland this evening as the Athletics send Sonny Gray to the mound against the Tigers' ace, Justin Verlander, in Game 5. The winner will get the Boston Red Sox in the American League Championship Series. Last night, St. Louis would open the scoring in a big way in the bottom of the second. Uh, Pirate starter Garrett Cole as David Fries gets all this pitch, sending it over the left field wall for a two-run shot. His first homer of the series. Check out the defensive play of the game. Cards, Pete Cosman robs Pittsburgh's Neil Walker with a beautiful diving catch. It's short. Bottom of the sixth will go now. Reliever Justin Wilson now pitching. John Jay strokes a single to center. That'll do the job, cleaning Matt Holliday, and it's 3-0 for the Cardinals. Pittsburgh finally scratches out a runoff. Adam Wainwright in the seventh. Pedro Alvarez with the infield single, and that pushes across Canada's Justin Morneau. But in the eighth, it's game, set, and match as Matt Adams absolutely crushes a pitch to right for a two-run big fly. The Cardinals take game 5-6-1. They will host the L.A. Dodgers in the NLCS, which begins tomorrow night. The Daytona Dodgers can win the senior men's baseball title with a victory over the Coastal Steel Orioles this evening at 7 at Baseball Central. They lead that series 3-1. And your LAK University Thunderwolves open another conference season at the Gardens tomorrow night at 7.30 against Royal Military College. Now here's Ryan Bonazzo with this week's Player Profile. This Thunderwolves Player Profile was brought to you by Frankie's Pizzeria. Fresh is better. Fifth-year senior Andrew Wilkins was a natural choice to serve as the Thunderwolves' captain this season. He's well-respected in the locker room and brings a jolt of energy every time he steps on the ice. He also has high expectations for himself and his teammates. But through the first three non-conference games of his captaincy, the team has yet to find a win. That's not good enough, he says. As a captain, you always want to lead your team to victories. You want to be a champion at the end of the year and at the end of the day that's the only thing that's really acceptable. Losing isn't acceptable and as a captain that's what you strive for. You strive to be top team and to win. Wilkins can score some goals for Lakehead. He's proven that over the past four years. But he's a defensive forward first and foremost who plays much bigger than his size. It's a mentality he traces back to his time spent on the blue line in minor hockey. I like to think that I could play an offensive role, but uh, for whatever reason, I think partially going back to my defenseman days, I, uh, I tend to try and be like the third man high or try and get back to my zone or be the last guy to leave my zone. Wilkins hopes to set an example for the younger players, both on and off the ice. For the rookies especially, he says, Playing in Thunder Bay is an experience like no other. A lot of them have been away for junior and hockey, hockey towns, but again, I think Thunder Bay is uh, an eye-opener for them with the, with the media here and the type of hockey town it is. I think they're, they're really enjoying it. Wilkins and the Wolves will try to bring some enjoyment to the Fort William Gardens faithful this weekend with a couple wins over the RMC Paladins. This Thunderwolves player profile was brought to you by Frankie's Pizzeria. Fresh is better. Well, five of the seven Canadian teams see the action in the NHL tonight. The Leafs visit Nashville. Vancouver welcomes San Jose. Minnesota entertains Winnipeg and Montreal's in Edmonton. Let's go to the ice last night. Nine minutes in, it'll be Calgary scoring first against Montreal. At least Stempney, I can't beat Habs goalie Curry Price, but rookie Sean Monaghan will. He has his third goal in three games. Later in the first, the Canadians cough it up. Monaghan to spin. Bershe for the easy tap-in. His first would make it 2-0 uh, after one period. The teams then trade power play goals in the second. First, it will be Curtis Glencross giving the home team a three-goal cushion. That's his second of the season. A buck 14 after that, Montreal snaps Joey McDonald's shadow bid as P.K. Subban finds the back of the net for his first. But the Flames hang on to win it 3-2. In Los Angeles, the Sens and Kings needed overtime to decide it. Jeff Carter tips a Mike Richards shot for his second of the game. Kings go on to win it 4-3, and Chicago and St. Louis were tied at 2 in the third. Final minute of this one, it's X leaf Alex Steen electing to shoot off the 3-on-1. The Blues edge the Hawks 3-2.
The eight-time Olympic cycling medalist Kurt Harnett of Thunder Bay will be Canada's chef de mission when Toronto hosts the Pan Am Games in 2015. Week six of the NFL kicks off in Chicago tonight with the three and two Bears hosting the winless New York Giants and the Winnipeg Blue Bombers, as has been the case all season, actually must win their game Monday in Montreal or they're out of the playoffs. Earlier this week, they traded their best defensive lineman, Alex Hall, to Saskatchewan. The players in there are professional players and they're supposed to go out there and they're going to play to the maximum ability no matter who's out there. The Bombers aren't waving the white flag yet, but with the playoffs now a near impossibility, the rebuilding process can begin. In return for Alex Hall, the Bombers getting 24-year-old offensive lineman Patrick Newfeld, who started 13 games last season, but has hardly played this season after breaking his leg in training camp. I like that he's got starting experience. He started at tackle, um, got thrown in the fire a little bit last year and, and rose to the occasion. Uh, all feedback are that he's, a, he's a, a good young offensive tackle with starting experience. The Bombers also give up a second round pick as part of the deal. Teams rebuilding seldom give up draft picks, but Walters has some sound reasoning behind the move. The thought is, would we have been able to acquire a player of Patrick Newfeld's ability with the second round pick this, this year's draft and, and the answer was no. While a quarterback is the Bombers most pressing need right now, Walter says no team was willing to part with one at this point and he says it might still be difficult to pry one loose in the offseason because of the expansion draft. If you lose a quarterback, you get to protect two other Canadians, so it might be in team's best interest to lose a quarterback to Ottawa so that they can protect two more Canadians versus trading a quarterback and, and whatever they can acquire. So that'll be the decision for those teams. Like Hall, Enoch Mwamba is also a free agent at season's end. And although negotiations have been slow, the Bombers won't be trading Mwamba as they continue their pursuit to sign their first overall pick. His agent's kind of, uh, he's, a, he's an interesting guy to deal with, I'll say. It's hard to get a read on him. Um, but as I said, the most recent one is positive that, that we're in discussions again and hopefully, who knows, I said him cautious. I'm optimistic that it's better than it was a couple, you know, a short time ago that we're, we're back talking. And the BC Lions have shored up their running game signing former Detroit Lions Stefan Logan, who has spent uh, the last four years in the NFL with Pittsburgh and Detroit. GM Wally Buono talks about the addition. Yes, if you want to get right to the point, it's, it's to improve the running game because Again, when Stefan was here, I think in 208, you know, he had a seven plus average per carry. And, you know, so, yeah, you know, uh, we need to improve our, our running game, uh, you know, and if that means we have to look at different options, then so be it. You know, uh, last week, I think our running backs averaged 1.6 yards per carry, which, you know, again, I'm not putting the onus just on them. I think collectively, uh, you know, um, it's not been good enough. And, you know, it seems like it's regressive, not progressing. And, you know, uh, sometimes you have to uh, look at other options. Uh, you know, uh, Andrew, Timmy uh, do a lot of things for us, but one thing right now we're not doing is running the football. High school junior boys football last night. St. Pat's won its first of the season, 36-8 over winless Hammershaw. Trenton Woodback ran for a pair of touchdowns. Colin Kramer had three touchdowns for Churchill as they blank Westgate 29-zip. The senior schedule today, one game is done and St. Ignatius remains unbeaten. They throttled Superior 64-6. Uh, Liam Fours had four touchdowns. Then we have Hammershaw and Westgate. And the nightcap is Churchill and St. Pat's. And when's the last time this time of year they're actually playing fo high school football and it's not windy and it's not cool? It's, and it's not rainy. Awesome. Yet. Yeah. 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 You're very happy, I know, about that St. Ignatius score. Too, yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> um, tonight uh, on Global Thunder Bay, going to be a bit of an emotional one on Glee as the show says goodbye to Finn Hudson and actor Corey Monteith. With your full lineup, here's Teletalk. Tonight on Global Thunder Bay at 8 on Welcome to the Family, Caroline's doctor has some unexpected news for Dan. At 8.30 on The Millers, with the divorce, Carol wants to rearrange the family cemetery plot. Then at 9 on Glee, it's the long-awaited farewell to Finn Hudson and actor Corey Monty. And at 10 on Elementary, Holmes tracks down a contractor who leaked classified information. Over on CKPR Thunder Bay at 8, the nature of things gets ticked off over Lyme disease. 
Then at 9, Deadly by Design gets down to the lucrative business of illegal synthetic drugs in Canada. And at 11.35, George has Dexter star Michael C. Hall in the red chair. Teletalk is brought to you by Points, the traffic ticket specialists. Well, hopefully you've been getting a chance to get out there and enjoy these beautiful temperatures because, Matt, I hear there is rain on the way. Rain in the forecast, and it's really not what you want to hear going into a long weekend, especially one like Thanksgiving. But uh, on the other side, some good temperatures, but there is rain, yes, which is the unfortunate part. Uh, I'll get to that in just a second for now. Uh, today, uh, beautiful skies, beautiful temperatures, 20 degrees. Uh, again, we're supposed to be seeing 10 degrees at this point, so some beautiful temperatures out in Thunder Bay today, mostly cloudy skies. That uh, Those clouds will be clearing in just a little bit. The wind got up to 17 kilometers an hour, uh, making things feel maybe just a little bit cooler than that 20 degrees. Let's have a look at what's happening across the country right now. Vancouver on the west coast, 12 degrees. Prince George at 7 under mostly cloudy skies into Edmonton and Calgary. Calgary also under a bunch of cloud cover in Edmonton. Uh, both temperature-wise are both at 11 degrees at this point. Into Saskatchewan looking at 16 and 17 uh, some uh, with sunshine as well in the Saskatchewan. So again, they're experiencing about the same type of weather that we are uh, at this point right now, which is beautiful stuff. Winnipeg also at 20. Again, a little more cloud cover in Winnipeg as that system starts to move up uh, into the region. Churchill at 8. Uh, again, that nice weather, that nice trend continues right into southern Ontario. Toronto, 17. Uh, mainly sunny skies, as is Ottawa and Montreal, with that uh, beautiful temperatures again as well. And uh, starting to see those moons. We're getting into that time of year as we get uh, into the dinner hour where that uh, clocks, so we're not going to set the clocks back for a few weeks yet, but uh, that we're going to start running out of sunshine just a little bit earlier than we have been. But again, 
and some beautiful temperatures. Halifax, 12 and St. John's at 11 degrees at this point. As we have a look at the systems map again right now, here is the low pressure systems that's going to be causing that instability over the next few days. It's going to come up tomorrow. We're still going to have a beautiful day tomorrow as, again, nothing to report there. But as we move into Saturday, we're not going to see the worst of it as the low moves up and a cold front moves through, but we're going to be right on the edge of it. And that's what's going to cause those pop up showers uh, to the west along the Manitoba border and, and move into Thunder Bay too as well. That part of that system, that tail part of that system is what's going to move into Thunder Bay uh, over the course uh, of the weekend, unfortunately, again. Can't really stress that enough on how unfortunate that is. Hopefully we don't get it too bad, but again, we'll see. Uh, tonight across the region, some more beautiful temperatures, especially for this time of year. It's hard to not to mention it enough. Kenora and Dryden, uh, 12, 11 degrees. Six only in, in Armstrong, uh, but again, not too bad for this time of year. Uh, heading into tomorrow, beautiful temperatures right across the board. We're going to see this in Thunder Bay as well, but how about 20? Another 20 in Sault Ste. Marie for the middle of October. Definitely can't complain about that. 18 along the North Shore, and those temperatures continue behind me as well, right into the western part of the region. Fort Francis going to see the big 2-0 as well tomorrow. Uh, Thunder Bay at this hour, 16 degrees. Again, that wind's starting to pick up just a little bit. It's cooling things off. It's going to cool things off pretty quickly over the next uh, couple of hours or so. Tonight, as I mentioned earlier, dropping down to a low of 6. Clouds are going to clear by about midnight. And again, we're not going to see that 6 till very early in the morning. So again, going to remain nice and the wind is going to taper off as well. Tomorrow, PA day for the kids. Hey, have fun on that, kids, if you're watching right now. We will be here in case you wanted to drop by and do some work for us. But again, that's up to you. Tomorrow morning, 9 degrees at 8 o'clock. Tomorrow morning, partly cloudy sky is going to be really nice over the course of tomorrow and wind uh, only up to 11 kilometers an hour. Having a look at that extended forecast, there's going to be a UV index tomorrow, believe it or not. It's only of 3, which is moderate, but there's going to be that UV index. As I mentioned, Saturday, pop-up showers. Still 17 degrees, so still fairly nice. But uh, we're going to drop down to that freezing mark, what we should be seeing uh, for our lows this time of year as well. So zero degrees on Sunday, 14, uh, but we do have a 60% chance of showers on Saturday, 60% chance of showers on Sunday. That risk is only 30% on Monday, so sh uh, should see some sun and cloud, but again, those lows dropping down to lower than we've seen. And then Tuesday, right after your long weekend to head back to work, how about some rain, six degrees, not even close to what we've been seeing and much cooler temperatures. So enjoy the warmer weather. Hopefully it doesn't rain too much on your Thanksgiving weekend. Say what? Yeah. <laughs> it's time to visit the Thunder Bay District Humane Society shelter where Fiona Gardner introduces us to a two-year-old cat named Momo. Hi, this week's Humane Society Pet of the Week is a real cuddler. She is purring away like a little train. This is Momo, and she is a two-year-old domestic medium hare. Momo is uh, a real sweetheart. She is very friendly with other cats, very mellow and laid back, and as you can see, will just cuddle in no matter what you want to do. She's probably looking for a home that's uh, relatively quiet and has uh, a lot of laps that she can curl up and cuddle in. Hi, baby girl. If you'd like to meet Momo, drop by the Humane Society on Roslyn Road. Your Pet of the Week has been brought to you by Thunder Pet. Expert advice and high-quality pet food within your budget. Well, some absolutely fascinating pictures from space to share with you. That's coming up right after these words.
some amazingly detailed images for you now from deep space. This is a nebula about, get this, 1,200 light years from Earth. It's called Toby's Jug. Now, those are wispy clouds and dust coming from a red star. The pictures come courtesy of a huge observatory located in Chile that's funded in part by 15 European countries. Just amazing to look at, aren't they? Mm -hmm. Pretty cool wow, stuff. We're going to recap our top story. Well, the city issued a news release today stating they are not liable for property damage by the May flood and that it was the heavy rainfall that caused the damage for property owners. And the last of baseball's division series will wrap up sometime tonight. It's game five between Detroit and Oakland. The winner gets the Boston Red Sox in the American League Championship Series. Weather-wise, one more nice day tomorrow before we see some rain this Thanksgiving weekend, unfortunately, and then the te temperature dips off after that fair, fair amount as well. So enjoy this uh, next couple days. So get the, the long underwear out and the heavy boots. <laughs> it's time. It's, it's just time. about yeah. there. <laughs> That'll do it for tonight's look at news, weather, and sports. Thank you all for being with us. A reminder for News On Demand, log on to tvnewswatch.com. We'll see you again tomorrow.